Church, this is the very first virtual church gathering uh, for La Puente in the history of La Puente congregation. So for that, we're very thankful. We're thankful for our recording team that has managed to put this together uh, in a form somewhat temporary to get us through this uh, phase, but also to look forward to a more permanent solution so that we can deliver messages from our churches and record those for those that are not able to join immediately. Uh, at this time, I wanted just to kind of share with you a couple of things that as we go forward, it is our desire to avail ourselves through uh, cell phone numbers or, or things like that, those that will be here in the morning to deliver a message and support the message to be able to send announcements or greetings directly. But for this morning, if this is if you're not able to, and I'm going to give you a number uh, that you can send this message during the services, so we could capture that afterwards if we need to. Uh, you can use my cell phone number three one zero two one eight two three zero two. Otherwise, you can email your announcements, prayer requests, greetings or any other information you wish to share to our secretaries, to our email account, acclapuente.org, at, I'm sorry, at gmail.com, and they will include that in a weekly bulletin. Uh, I just want to remind you of the announcement that we sent out yesterday morning that due to uh, the governor's executive order, uh, our inability to meet in person uh, will stay in effect until further notice. We hope that by the end of this month, we can definitely return to our church services in, in this building. But until that time, we will continue, by God's grace, to deliver messages here from, from the pulpit every Sunday morning. We're also looking at uh, ways to perhaps uh, start a Bible study at 10 a.m. And for that, we will be sending a separate information during the week and see if we can organize that as well. Uh, I have included a few things in the uh, uh, announcement yesterday. We have included a few things, so I pray that you would have opportunity to read those, and if you have any questions, to submit to us. So at this time, I would ask that you would uplift Brother Joe in prayer as he would deliver a message this morning, and that you would uh, stay with us uh, for this message this morning, and then send us also any feedback or any uh, opportunities that we may need to improve this experience as we go forward. Since we cannot have a group singing, I just thought I'll read a, from a Zahar Harp from the song one, the uh, opening one verse. It says, Hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, with harp and psaltery in accord. Unto his name give glory. Within his temple now unite to bring him worship, meet, and right. And hear salvation's story, praise him, raise him songs in union, bless communion, to him be singing, and the new song to him be bringing. With this, we'll turn it over to Brother Joe. Thank you, Brother Dushko. As we begin and open the word this morning, let's bow with a prayer. Father, as we open thy word as we've gathered here um, at this electronic place. We do pray that you'd be with us and watch over us and guide our thoughts and our minds toward thee. Through Christ we pray, amen. I'd like if you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We've been going through Corinthians um, and starting with chapter just going back to chapter 7, uh, Paul is talking about the letters that he is answering to the Corinthians. He is responding to the Corinthians that have written to him. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote me. He's responding to a letter and going through the items one by one. And now in chapter 8, he's going on to the next subject. And I'd like to read it all of chapter 8. Now as touching things offered unto idols, this is a new subject that he has, 
We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some, with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see that uh, see thee, which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol, idol's temple? Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth lest I make my brother to offend. I'd like to stop there. Let's just bow for a word of prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, as we have our first electronic message delivered from this building to our congregation, we pray, O oh God, that as we have come together united in spirit, and virtually united as local congregation, we pray, O oh Father, that this opportunity would be a reminder of thy continuing love and grace and mercy towards us, that we can have this technology, that we can have this privilege, that we can look into thy word and continue the pattern that we have been taught, and that is that the church, though physically we may not be able to assemble must go on until thou wouldst return, that the gates of hell would not prevail against, against it as thy word proclaims. And for that, we are very thankful. Lord, in this time of uncertainty of various sort that the world, the globe is experiencing, we pray, we continue to pray first and foremost that thou wouldst work in our hearts and our minds, that that would give us the sense of calm and peace, that we would be that badly needed example in this world, that placing our trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and trusting in thy promises and thy providence, O God, and thy sovereignty is the first and foremost. Thou has not promised that life would be easy on this earth until thou would return, and this is just another example of tribulation that we must go through. But there is no reason that we need to cower in fear and run away from things, but that with our faith in thee, we could continue to serve thee in whatever path thou has opened for us. There are so many opportunities that thou has opened for us in this time of need, for we know that so many are in anxiety and fear and concern about this global pandemic. We trust, O oh God, that thou wouldst continue to guide our local congregation, individual members, our leadership. We pray for our guidance and direction as much as we pray for the local, state, and national, and global governments, Lord, that they would be able to continue to deal with this. But mostly, O oh God, we pray that this time of unique circumstances would be an opportunity that we would draw closer unto thee, our living God, spend more time in prayer and in thy word as we continue to study from the Corinthians, Father, just simply to continue to go about our daily lives to the extent that we can, 
to reflect that our faith is in thee and thy promises, though we may be concerned and are not certain what this outcome may bring, but we sure know who is in charge. Bless the reading, meditation, and expounding of the word, and bless Brother Joe for his willingness to serve this morning and the recording team to come and set up this for all of us to appreciate and enjoy that ultimately we can give thee the praise and honor and glory which thou so badly deserves. And Lord, that we would through this be able to invite others to come and experience that to what does it mean to have peace with God and peace of God in their hearts and in minds, in their minds. We humbly ask and, and pray for this in Christ's name. Amen. So as we look at this chapter, uh, at the very beginning, it's very clear, Paul is answering the Corinthians questions, uh, this question, now is touching things offered to idols. Back in the day, there would be not just sacrifices, the Israelites we know, of course, had sacrifices, but uh, this was a common practice among many of the ancient religions. And there would be a sacrifice brought to the uh, temple or to the place of worship, and they would offer it unto their God, and then part of it would go to the, the local priests there. And not all of the priests, you know, the priests would not eat all of it. And what would you do with the extra? They would sell it at the market. They'd exchange that offering for money. And so this this food that had been sacrificed to idols that the priest of that particular god would um, have access to and then take to the market and, and exchange it for money that was available to be bought on the open market. And there is a question on whether it would be something that we should uh, partake of because it was food offered to idols or not because the Christians back then, just as now, they commingled. Uh, with everybody, the, you know, as we go through life, you don't just associate with Christians only. And so there was this question that was brought up. And Paul's going to answer that question. And in chapter 10, actually, he condemns it. But here he makes it plain that there is no such thing as an idol. It's not real. People might think it's real, but there is just one God and one creator of the universe. There is just Jesus Christ, and that is all. So therefore, the offering that's there to these other gods with a little g um, is not really an offering to anything that is real or true. And so therefore, how can that offering be to anything and so the knowledge of this was causing people to say, I'm free. I'm free to eat whatever I want. But yet there were some that were really disturbed by this. And there was contention in the Corinthian church. So going on, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that all have knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge puffeth up but charity edifies. So let's talk about that, that word, puffeth up. So Paul is here contrasting and comparing knowledge to charity or what we know as the word love in the English language. Knowledge and love. Kind of an odd thing, I think. He's going to be addressing things offered unto idols, but right away he gets into this idea of knowledge and love. And this knowledge, when it says puffeth up, indeed, that Greek word, it means to inflate like in a balloon or a bubble, to puff up, uh, to puff up and to make proud. Uh, charity, love, is different. It's that self-sacrificing, it's that agape love. And even though we've been reading through Corinthians, and we're going to get to Ch Corinthians 13, which talks about this in detail, I do want to read it now. 1 Corinthians 13, uh, starting with verse just 4 and 5, I think. Charity suffereth long, or is patient. Charity is kind. It does not envy. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Charity 
is not puffed up, the opposite of knowledge, doth not behave itself unseemly, speaketh, seeketh not her own, is not looking out for herself, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never fails. So we need to have that firmly in our mind because Paul wanted it firmly in the Corinthian mind that charity never failed. It says that charity edify us. And edifying is a building up. An edifice is a building. And when you think of a building that is constructed from the ground up, charity, you know, layer by stone upon stone, layer upon layer, you build up the building and that's what charity does. And so Paul is making it clear that this question about Sacrifice, eating things sacrificed unto idols has nothing to do with eating things sacrificed unto idol, idols. It has nothing to do with that knowledge, but it has everything to do with love. And so let's see where he goes with this. Verse 2, if any man think he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as yet he ought to know. And I think we have understand that and we've seen that in our lives. We see people in life that are proud, that are arrogant, that know a lot. But really, they don't really understand. They don't have the wisdom to apply it. It goes on to say, uh, the, the verse 3, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. So there's the only knowledge that is important here in this chapter, to be known of God. And how do you become known of God? Is to love God. And as concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are sacrificed, offered and sacrificed unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other one but God. For though there be, there, um, for though there be that are called gods with a little g, whether in heaven or earth, as there be gods many or lords many, but unto us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. We all know that. But not everybody knew that. Not anybody had that, that understanding. And as we go down through the passage, howbeit that there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worst. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block. So he's very plainly sta stating that the idol, this meat sacrifice to idol, what has gone on with that meat ahead of time, it's really nothing. But some people think, think. It might not be true, but this is what they think. And you would think that we just need to teach them better. You would think that Paul says, Take these people apart, take them aside, give them an education. Train them the right way so that they understand that this meat sacrificed unto an idol is really nothing. And then everything's going to be okay. But he doesn't go there. He says, but take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them. You know, right here in verse 9 is called a liberty. By the time we get to verse 12, it's called a sin. But when ye so sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. So a lot of times in our lives, we're thinking about liberty. But really, depending on what's going on around it, put it in context, it could be sin. If there was going to be a title to this message, it's... Uh, Things made of matter don't matter. When I was young, I, I don't know how old I was. But I'm thinking I might have been 
six or seven years old, I had a pocket knife. My grandfather had given me just a little old, um, straight old timer, I think it was. And as little boys do, what do you do with the pocket knife, right? You throw it. That's what you do with the pocket knife. And I would throw it, and I would throw it, and I would stick it in trees, and it would break. But this was my pocket knife. And I remember I was, why do that enough? You older, maybe I was going to show them. Uh, but Lori, she was upset. And she was upset because to her, that was a gun. And is not so important that I need to keep it. Yes, this, there was a sentimental tie. Yes, it was a gift from my father. Yes, 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 yes. But the truth of the matter is that things made of matter don't matter. And for $5, it was gone. So many times when we come across personal relationships that are strained because of physical things, right? Things, thoughts, understandings that we have that are different. There is this bitterness that starts to build. And it's a bitterness that God doesn't want to be there, especially between brothers and sisters. And even though we're, when, when you think of the, this chapter that we just read, how unreasonable these people were. We know that this food was sacrificed to an idol that doesn't exist and that really because that idol doesn't exist, that it's, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the idol, this physical thing that's made of a tree exists, but there's no realness to it, right? There is no God that that idol represents. It's it's. A vapor, it's an illusion. Don't we know that? Why are you making an issue of this? And so many times in our lives we do the exact same thing. And a lot of times we'd like to say, oh no, but our thing is different. It's different for me. You don't understand. You give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Paul wasn't worried about that. He says, but take heed lest by any man's this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Let's talk about that. But when ye so sin against the brethren, ye wound their weak conscience and ye sin against Christ. That's verse 12. I want to take you to Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, this is the account of Paul. At this time, his name is Saul, and it says in Acts 9, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. So here's Saul. He is a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he has, he's getting letters to go, um, letters, and they, he desired of them letters, to Damascus to go to the synagogue and to find any any person that was in this way it says in that was a Christian that he might bring them to bound unto Jerusalem he was persecuting this church breathing threatenings and slaughterings <laughs> threatenings and slaughter sorry and while he was traveling to Damascus verse four he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying Saul Saul why persecutest thou me? This is Christ talking to Paul. When did Paul persecute Christ? He didn't persecute Christ. He was persecuting the brethren, but Christ took it personally. And Christ said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus who thou, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the, those, those convictions that he was having. You know, as a father, when you look at your children, when you don't, you don't want them to get hurt, you don't want them to anything bad to go with them, and and if if indeed something or some harm would threaten them, you're there. 
back in 2015, we went up to Alaska uh, to visit Cousin Michelle. And uh, during that time or a little time after, there, was, uh, there, there were moose just walking out in the front yard, right? Walking down the street. She's, she's, it's amazing how wild it still is there. And a university pr professor was killed on campus because when he walked out of the building door, he came in between a mother moose and her calf, right? And the mother moose did not take that lightly. And here, as we read in 1 Corinthians, but when ye so sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Where did sin come into the picture? Weren't we just talking about a liberty? But I think this is the point that Paul is dri driving right now, is that the thing might be a liberty, but once it becomes an issue between you and your spouse, between you and your family, between you and your physical brother or your physical sister or your co-worker, it's beyond a liberty. Paul ends up saying, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. And then, of course, we'll go into the debate, well, what does it mean to offend? Am I really offending? Stop it. It's not that important. This is what Paul's saying. Stop it. He doesn't give any license. He makes it very plain. Yes, indeed, there are other verses where Paul, um, other passages where Paul uh, indeed has to talk to Peter because Peter is not behaving properly. And there are these other passages that you can say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that fit my situation so I don't have to stop it. But we're looking at it wrong. Paul is very plain here in the chapter that the focus of touching things offered to idols has nothing to do with the things offered to idols, but it has to do with the heart. It has to do with our relationship with others. We talked about, is there something in our life that we would not give up for something you love, someone you love? You know, when I was, um, when I had that BB gun, right? Uh, for some reason, I don't know why, but in my father's top dresser drawer were half a dozen bullets. Now, of course, a BB gun does not shoot bullets. Tacitly, I guess. But you know, as a little kid, 11 years old or so, um, I took the littlest one. It was different types of bullets. I don't know why he had them there. I took the littlest one. And I went out in the backyard, and somehow my 11-year-old mind um, figured that if you stuck it in the dirt, that bullet part wasn't going to go dangerous anywhere, and that, you know, if anything moved, it was going to be the shell that flew off the back. And I got 10, 15 feet back and built myself up a little, you know, whatever you would think to protect yourself at that age. And I, and I shot the primer, right? Um, I tell you this, I never did find a bullet or the shell, I don't think. Um, I tell you that because somehow my mom found out. And there must have been some contention about those bullets in the top drawer. You know, my father didn't have a gun. There wasn't a gun in the house. Because those bullets disappeared. And they went away. For whatever reason... They were important enough to my father that he kept them in there. He had, might have had some memories or whatever reason that those, those are there. But there was obviously some contention. And this incident sparked a resolution of the contention. But do you have to have incidents to res resolve contentions? We shouldn't have to have incidents. 
we should be sensitive. And even though um, we can probably pretty easily say that, yeah, you know, for my wife, I'd give up anything. For my son, my daughter, I'd give up anything. What about for your neighbor, a friend, your brother or your sister? Would you give up things? Would you give up matter that doesn't matter? As it was with Paul on that road to Damascus, Christ took it personally. When Paul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against his church, Christ took it personally. And here again in uh, chapter 8, where it says, But brethren, when you, sin so against, when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. It's, it's serious. It's no longer a liberty. It's no longer just something I want to do and I should be free to do it. If it's come to, if it's come to the attention of someone, you've got to work it out. And if it doesn't work out the way you want it, it needs to work out the way God wants it. May the Lord bless his word. Thank you, Joe, for the message. Uh, we were informed that uh, Wi-Fi went down for a few minutes during the sermon, so we apologize. The, these are the uh, birth pains of this new uh, methodology, but hopefully you were able to... Uh, hear the gist of it and uh, the major portion of the message as we continue to work on this. What's important here is perhaps to just close with a couple of thoughts on this chapter, which always brings uh, a good healthy debate, and that's good. A couple of things I want to just add, if, if I could. When he talks about these liberties in Christ, these freedoms in Christ, a couple of things we can observe from this example. First, that God has simply said so that spiritual maturity is not a consistent fact in everybody's life. Just like our physical lives, we grow and mature and uh, <clears throat> gain understanding and knowledge at different levels and different speed, if you will, and different rate, and that at some point in time that we all vary even in that person, you know, that, that respect. Well, spiritual growing and maturity is somewhat similar, that it is by God's grace that he is giving us this opportunity where we need to be motivated and zealous and desirous to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and of his word and his teaching. So there is an opportunity that God gives us through his word and his spirit, but there is a part that we also participate in. And as a result, we are maturing at different levels. Some perhaps remain content to understand just the simplest of the teachings of the salvation and perhaps stay at that level and that's not what really scripture wants. So we have here example of a, a more mature brother like Apostle Paul and those that were weaker in faith, they were very concerned about this example. What we will, you will find in this example and this is a good guide as we try to deal with this topic is that sincerely and honestly spiritually weaker brother will never demand of the more mature brother, like in this case, a weaker brother did not demand from Apostle Paul not to eat the meat. So that is the difference because there are some brethren that would like to impose their own understanding and demand that everybody else behaves in that matter. That's not what this example clearly points out. Well, this example points out that a spirit, there are spiritually weaker brothers and sisters. They will express that perhaps in their understanding of the matter. But those that are spiritually mature 
would desire out of love to help them out. Paul is not stating a command here that a spiritually mature brother in this case, like him, he's not demanding that none would eat meat. He's choosing that path as a way of sacrifice out of love for the weaker brother that if it's necessary, he would not eat meat for the rest of his life because he wants to help the weaker brother or sister in this case. So I think that's a clear separation and differentiation of how we, we can sense and understand where we need to do. But in concluding, I want to just remind us of, of this liberty, particularly in North America, our freedom is a very big thing. And look what Paul writes to the Galatians. He says, uh, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. This is that freedom that we're talking about in Christ. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So with this, we'll conclude our services in the name of the Lord. Let's just have a word of prayer once again. Heavenly Father and our God, we, I want to thank thee for this morning, though we had some technical challenges maybe to deliver electronically this message. We pray, Lord, that that would help us as we continue to improve this method that we can stay connected, that we can continue to deliver your word, your instruction, your message to, to thy people and anyone that desires to listen. Bless those that are involved and Brother Joe for his service this morning and just continue to be with us. Protect us, watch over us, be our protector and our guide as thou hast promised that thou wouldst and we would give thee the honor, praise and glory in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Joe.